1893 rolled into 1894, both Alexander Berkman and Emma Goldman were in prison. Berkman in Pennsylvania for attempted murder, and Goldman in New York City for incitement to riot. In their respective memoirs, both of them described their impressions of the other inmates. I want you to hear both of those descriptions side by side, because they strike me as really different. Here's what Berkman had to say. At times, the realization of my fate is borne in upon me with the violence of a shock and I am engulfed in despair. Now threatening to break down the barriers of sanity, now affording melancholy satisfaction in the wild play of fancy. Existence grows more and more unbearable with the contrast of dream and reality. Weary of the day's routine, I welcome the solitude of the cell, impatient even of the greeting of the passing convict. I shrink from the uninvited familiarity of these men. The horizontal gray and black constantly reviving the image of the tigress with her stealthy, vicious cunning. They are not of my world. I would aid them, as in duty bound to the victims of social injustice, but I cannot be friends with them. They do not belong to the people to whose service my life is consecrated. Unfortunates, indeed, yet parasites upon the producers, less in degree but no less in kind than the rich exploiters. By virtue of my principles rather than their deserts, I must give them my intellectual sympathy. They touch no chord in my heart. I've read that paragraph so many times, and I'm still struck by its iciness and its condescension. He doesn't say why he thinks they're parasites. Is it just because they also happen to be in jail, just like he is? Is he just naturally that much better than them? He really doesn't try to understand their stories at all. I guess that's because they touch no chord in his heart. As much as he's dedicated his life to helping the workers, when it comes down to it, when he actually has to talk to them, he doesn't like them. Now listen to Goldman. At first she describes the other inmates awaiting trial at the tombs, and then those in prison with their at Blackwell's Island. My three weeks in the tombs had given me ample proof that the revolutionary contention that crime is the result of poverty is based on fact. Most of the defendants who were awaiting trial came from the lowest strata of society. Men and women without friends, often even without a home. Unfortunate, ignorant creatures they were, but still with hope in their hearts because they had not yet been convicted. In the penitentiary, despair possessed almost all the prisoners. It served to unveil the mental darkness, fear, and superstition which held them in bondage. Among the seventy inmates, there were no more than half a dozen who showed any intelligence whatsoever. The rest were outcasts, without the least social consciousness. Their personal misfortune filled their thoughts. They could not understand that they were victims in an endless chain of injustice and inequality. I mean, she is a little condescending, too. She could have just said that they were victims of injustice and inequality. She didn't have to say that they were incapable of understanding that fact. But I do want to note how she understood that these women were in prison not because they were born to be criminals or because they were bad people, but because crime is a product of economic inequality. On the whole, she strikes me as much more empathetic and that she really wants to understand the other people there with her. She doesn't just write them off. As we'll see, for both Goldman and Berkman, their connections to the other inmates grew as time went on. I'm Jeff Grossman, and this is Across from Jericho, an activist history podcast. This season, we're talking about the famous, or infamous, anarchists Emma Goldman and Alexander Berkman. In this episode, Goldman, 
once she gets out of prison, becomes a nurse and a midwife, and helps deliver babies to poor families on the Lower East Side. The cold December air in Goldman's cell caused her to have an attack of rheumatism, which in turn sent her to the sick ward. I would say that that was probably actually one of the luckiest things that ever happened to her, because she wound up meeting the visiting doctor, a guy named Dr. White. Dr. White was obviously impressed by her, and he explained that the city's budget didn't allow for any sort of permanent professional medical staff at the sick ward. He chuckled, then asked me if I should not like to remain in the hospital to take care of the sick. I should indeed, I replied, but I know nothing about nursing. He assured me that neither did anyone else in the prison. He had tried for some time to induce the city to put a trained nurse in charge of the ward, but he had not succeeded. For operations and grave cases, he had to bring a nurse from the charity hospital. I could easily pick up the elementary things about tending the sick. He would teach me to take the pulse and temperature and to perform similar services. He would speak to the warden and the head matron if I wanted to remain. Goldman did want to remain, and it turned out that she had a real talent for nursing. Maybe for the first time in her life, it gave her a chance to take her ideas about social justice and put them to use in a way that genuinely helped people. Then, a crackdown on the city's sex workers led to a new wave of prisoners that needed treatment. In March 1894, we received a large influx of women prisoners. They were nearly all prostitutes rounded up during the recent raids. The city had been blessed by a new vice crusade. The Lexow Committee, with the Reverend Dr. Parkhurst at its head, wielded the broom which was to sweep New York clean of the fearful scourge. The men found in the public houses were allowed to go free, but the women were arrested and sentenced to Blackwell's Island. Most of the unfortunates came in deplorable condition. They were suddenly cut off from the narcotics which almost all of them had been habitually using. The sight of their suffering was heartbreaking. With the strength of giants, the frail creatures would shake the iron bars, curse and scream for dope and cigarettes. Then they would fall exhausted to the ground, pitifully moaning through the night. The misery of the poor creatures brought back my own hard struggle to live without the soothing effects of cigarettes. Except for the ten weeks of my illness in Rochester, I had smoked for years sometimes as many as forty cigarettes a day. When we were very hard-pressed for money, and it was a toss-up between bread and cigarettes, we would generally decide to buy the latter. We simply could not go for very long without smoking. Being cut off from the satisfaction of the habit when I came to the penitentiary, I found the torture almost beyond endurance. The nights in the cell became doubly hideous. The only way to get tobacco in prison was by means of bribery. I knew that if any of the inmates were caught bringing me cigarettes, they would be punished. I could not expose them to that risk. Snuff tobacco was allowed, but I could never take to it. There was nothing to be done but to get used to the deprivation. I had resisting power, and I could forget my craving in reading. Not so the new arrivals. When they learned that I was in charge of the medicine chest, they pursued me with offers of money. Worse still, with pitiful appeals to my humanity. Just a whiff of dope for the love of Christ. (laughs) I rebelled against the Christian hypocrisy which allowed the men to go free and sent the poor women to prison for having ministered to the sexual demands of those men. Suddenly cutting off the victims from the narcotics they had used for years seemed ruthless. I would have gladly given the addicts what they craved so terribly. It was not fear of punishment which kept me from bringing them relief. It was Dr. White's faith in me. He had trusted me with the medicines. He had been kind and generous. I could not fail him. The screams of the women would unnerve me for days. But I stuck to my responsibility. 
not too long after that, Goldman was let out in August of 1894, a couple of months ahead of schedule. I want to take a minute here, though, because some of the stories that both Berkman and Goldman tell about their time in prison shed some light on their understanding, or lack thereof, of questions of racial justice. If you read Berkman's Prison Memoirs of an Anarchist, he describes black prisoners in ways that today are unquestionably racist. I thought for a long time about whether or not I should include those descriptions here. I decided not to for just one simple reason, which is that I can't bring myself to repeat them. I just can't do it. I realize that there's a journalistic argument to be made that perhaps I'm not being transparent. Maybe I'm sugarcoating things. All I can say is I'm not trying to hide the ball. And on the show's website, there are links to prison memoirs of an anarchist. So if you want to see for yourself what he said, you can certainly go do that. Professor Jacqueline Jones teaches history at the University of Texas, Austin, and she's the author of Goddess of Anarchy, The Life and Times of Lucy Parsons, American Radical. Professor Jones gave me some background context about how anarchists at the time thought about race or didn't. Well, again, it's difficult to generalize about all anarchists, but I, I will say that Lucy and Albert were part of a German working class community in Chicago that really had no commitment to or interest in the rights of African-American workers in Chicago. I mean, in a way we would be surprised by that. These are people who consider themselves radical, consider themselves progressive with a small P, and yet they had absolutely no interest in black civil rights. And one of the reasons is at that time in Chicago, the black community is not large. Uh, there's a lot of discrimination against Black workers. Many of them are working in segregated workplaces. They don't have a lot to do with white workers. They're in segregated communities. They're not next door neighbors to white workers. I mean, we see a lot of prejudice among the anarchists, the socialists too. The socialists and the anarchists are very dismissive um, and indifferent to the Chinese, <laughs> Chinese Americans, Chinese workers. You know, they're very worried that Chinese workers, like Black workers, are going to work for low wages and undercut the ability of white American workers to earn a living wage. So, yeah, their magazines, their newspapers are filled with articles, especially about the threat of Chinese workers on the West Coast. But uh, this is... This is a period when European anarchism does have an influence in America and uh, European anarchism, of course, had no room for people of color as a, as a separate group that deserved special consideration considering past injustices toward them. That idea of correcting for past injustices strikes me as essential, and I would have thought that was a more modern concept, but I would have been wrong about that. And in one really startling passage, Goldman talks about how her white privilege was pointed out to her, and she totally dismissed the idea. The day after she was released, Goldman wrote a long article in the New York World explaining about her time in prison. In it, she said the matron unfairly favored black prisoners. In Living My Life, she talks about how while she was a nurse, sometimes portions of milk and eggs for the patients would go missing. A few days later... I was told by the prisoner who brought the hospital rations that the missing portions had been given by this head matron to two husky Negro prisoners. That also did not surprise me. I knew she had a special fondness for the colored inmates. She rarely punished them and often gave them unusual privileges. In return, her favorites would spy on the other prisoners, even on those of their own color who were too decent to be bribed. I myself never had any prejudice against colored people. In fact, I felt deeply for them because they were being treated like slaves in America. But I hated discrimination. The idea that sick people, white or colored, should be robbed of their rations to feed healthy persons outraged my sense of justice but I was powerless to do anything in the matter. Then, after she was released, she was invited for dinner by her friend John Swinton, 
a journalist and an abolitionist. On our arrival, John Swinton, tall and erect, with a silk cap on his white hair, proceeded to scold me for what I had said about the Negroes in prison. He had read in the New York world my disclosures of conditions in the penitentiary. He liked the article, but he was grieved to see that Emma Goldman had the white man's prejudice against the colored race. I was dumbfounded. I could not understand how anyone, least of all a man like John Swinton, could read race prejudice into my story. I had pointed out the discrimination between sick and starved white women and Negro favorites. I should have protested as much had colored women been robbed of their rations. To be sure, Swinton replied, still, you should not have emphasized the partiality. We white people have committed so many crimes against the Negro that no amount of extra kindness can atone for them. The matron is no doubt a beast, but I forgive her much for her sympathy with the poor Negro prisoners. But she was not moved by such considerations, I protested. She was kind because she could use them in every despicable way. Swinton was not convinced. He had been closely allied with the most active abolitionists. He had fought and been wounded in the Civil War. It was apparent that his feeling for the colored race had made him partial. There was no use arguing the matter further. Moreover, Mrs. Swinton was calling us to the table. So she couldn't even understand her blindness towards questions of racial justice, even when it was pointed out to her by people she otherwise admired. Professor Kathy Ferguson is a professor of political science and women, gender, and sexuality studies at the University of Hawaii. She is also the author of Emma Goldman, Political Thinking in the Streets. Professor Ferguson explained to me how anarchists at the time really didn't pay too much attention to efforts to improve racial justice. They thought that those efforts to improve things were simply not revolutionary enough. They also assumed that their larger efforts to address class differences would somehow fix racism at the same time. I think that anarchists of this time, and remember I'm talking about Paris Commune to Spanish Revolution, I think anarchists of that time typically did not have a good analysis of blackness. They tended to make an overly abrupt distinction between reform and revolution. And they thought anything that was trying to make for a better position within the system was mere reform, and it wasn't worth doing, which is why they were opposed to suffrage. And so uh, African-American efforts to get the vote, to be citizens at all, were, I think, wrongly left unattended. They were It wasn't so much as they were rejected as they just weren't thought about um, because it was seen as not revolutionary enough. Whereas the uh, John Brown and Harper's Ferry, that was great. That was revolutionary. They're they're all for that. Uh, The same with the Magone brothers in Mexico. They were two men uh, who were leaders of a sort of Mexican anarchist group within the Mexican revolution. And they got lots of support from anarchists in the US and England and other parts of the world uh, because they were revolutionaries. They they were identifiable as seeking transformation rather than reform. And one of my complaints about anarchism and one of my things I think we need to change is I think we need a better analysis of the relationship between revolution and reform and rather than just dismissing things that I don't think anything is mere reform on the surface. You have to look and see where it might take you. And you have to understand a connection between those two things. So I'd say that's one big problem that anarchists had was that they were overconfident that they knew what radical was because it meant essentially revolutionary struggle. It meant general strikes. It meant armed resistance. It meant all the stuff that would lead up to general strikes and armed resistance. I think they also, what I would just call a very bad analysis of race in that they led with class and they led with the state. And then when women came along like Goldman, then gender and sexuality get mixed in and become part of the intersectional pot. But very few, in fact, I have to say I found none 
of the um, English and American anarchists in England and the U.S. who thought of race as having a particular history that needed to be understood in a specific set of power relations that couldn't be reduced to class. So when Goldman and Bertman looked at black workers, they saw workers who happened to be black and they would periodically castigate other anarchists for being prejudiced. They were not in favor of that. They would bemoan uh, the race riots uh, in the in the late teens, early 20s. They would talk about who's violent in the South. It's white people violent against black people. They knew those things, but they didn't have any historical or structural analysis of racism to put it in. And so it became an individual prejudice. People should just change their minds. They should just stop being prejudiced. Whereas, of course, Goldman would never have turned to a capitalist and said, oh, you should just change your mind about the workers. You should just stop being prejudiced. She knew that class prejudice was built into capitalism. It was a requirement of capitalism. She never got that racism was built into the structure of white supremacy. She never saw that as something that needed to be analyzed. If you're enjoying this episode, be sure to visit acrossfromjericho.com, where you can find links to all of our socials and a sign-up sheet for our email newsletter. And for just $3 a month, you can join our Patreon. Patrons will have access to a special monthly mini-episode, a monthly live group chat, and a monthly book discussion group. You can even help pick which books we read. These benefits might change as we figure out what works best. So if you have any suggestions, feel free to email me. My email is jeffgrossman at acrossfromjericho.com. Or email me about anything else. I'd love to hear from you. At the same time, but in very different ways, Goldman and Berkman were also struggling to wrap their heads around LGBTQ issues. For Goldman, it was an intellectual question, at least for now. For Berkman, who was still in prison, it was a much more visceral experience. From the summer of 1895 to the spring of 1896, Goldman, who is now 26 years old, was on an extended tour of Europe. She spent several months continuing her nursing training and learning how to be a midwife. This was at the world-famous Allegmina Krankenhaus, a hospital and medical school in Vienna. Part of her coursework there involved classes in psychology and sexuality, from one Professor Bruhl, and also from Sigmund Freud himself. Here's how she described her reaction. Professor Bruhl was an old man with a feeble voice. The subjects he taught were mystifying to me. He talked of earnings, lesbians, and other strange topics. His hearers, too, were strange, feminine-looking men with coquettish manners, and women, distinctly masculine, with deep voices. They were certainly a peculiar assembly. Greater clarity in these matters came to me later on, when I heard Sigmund Freud. His simplicity and earnestness and the brilliance of his mind combined to give one the feeling of being led out of the dark cellar into the broad daylight. For the first time, I grasped the full significance of sex repression and its effects on human thought and action. Meanwhile, back in Pennsylvania, one of Berkman's fellow inmates, a guy nicknamed Wild Bill, was openly gay, or in Berkman's language, a self-confessed invert. Berkman says that this guy, Wild Bill, had some sort of special relationship going on with the warden. In little ways, I seek to help the men in solitary. Every trifle means so much. Long Joe, the rangeman, whose duty it is to attend to their needs, is engrossed with his own troubles. The poor fellow is serving 25 years. And he is much worried by Wild Bill and Big Head Wilson. They are constantly demanding to see the warden. It is remarkable that they are never refused. The gods seem to stand in fear of them. Wild Bill is a self-confessed invert, and there are those peculiar rumors concerning his intimacy with the warden. Recently, Bill complained of indigestion, and a god sent me to deliver some delicacies to him. 
From the warden's table, he remarked, with a sly wink. But then things take a perhaps surprising turn. While Goldman was in Europe, Berkman was getting ready to testify in front of a committee that was investigating the prison administration. One day, the warden transferred him to a different part of the prison, ostensibly for talking too much, but Berkman thought it was really to disrupt his planning to testify. He purposely threw a temper tantrum and broke up some furniture, which for some reason he thought would get him transferred back to his old cell. Instead, he got sent to the dungeon. In a cell nearby, there was a guy named Johnny Davis, who was there for picking a fight. The two of them started up a conversation between their cells. Here's how Berkman described it years later in Prison Memoirs of an Anarchist. Johnny grows more tranquil, and, and we converse about his family history, talking in a frank, confidential manner. With a glow of pleasure, I become aware of the note of tenderness in his voice. Presently, he surprises me by asking, Friend Alec, what do they call you in Russian? He prefers the fond Sashenka, enunciating the strange word with quaint endearment, then diffidently confesses dislike for his own name and relates the story he had recently read of a poor castaway Cuban youth. Felipe was his name, and he was just like himself. Shall I call you Felipe, I offer. Yes, please do, Alec, dear. No, Sashenka. The springs of affection well up deep within me as I lie huddled on the stone floor, cold and hungry. With closed eyes, I picture the boy before me, with his delicate face and sensitive, girlish lips. Good night, dear Sashenka, he calls. Good night, little Felipe. Then the conversation got interrupted when the deputy warden came by. Johnny, a.k.a. Felipe, asked the deputy how long he was going to be the dungeon for, but the deputy, instead of answering, just cursed at him. Then Berkman chimed in and told the deputy to show some respect. After the deputy left, their conversation picked up again. The incident cements our intimacy. Our first diffidence disappears, and we become openly tender and affectionate. The conversation lags. We feel weak and worn. But every little while we hail each other with words of encouragement. Smithy incessantly paces the cell. The gnawing of the river rats reaches our ears. The silence is frequently pierced by the wild yells of the insane man, startling us with dread foreboding. The quiet grows unbearable, and Johnny calls again. What are you doing, Sashenka? Oh, nothing. Just thinking, Felipe. Am I in your thoughts, dear? Yes, Kitty, you are. Sasha, dear, I've been thinking, too. What, Felipe? You are the only one I care for. I haven't a friend in the whole place. Do you care much for me, Felipe? Will you promise not to laugh at me, Sashenka? <laughs> I wouldn't laugh at you. Cross your hand over your heart? Got it, Sasha? Yes. Well, I'll tell you. I was thinking, Sashenka, if you were here with me, I would like to kiss you. An unaccountable sense of joy glows in my heart. I muse in silence. What's the matter, Sashenka? Why don't you say something? Are you angry with me? No, Felipe, you foolish little boy. You are laughing at me. No, dear, I feel just as you do. Really? Yes. Oh, I am so glad, Sashenka. In the evening, the guards descend to relieve Johnny. He is to be transferred to the basket, they inform him. 
On the way past my cell, he whispers, Hope I'll see you soon, Sashenka. A friendly officer knocks on the outer blind door of my cell. That you, Berkman? You want to behave to the deputy? He's put you down for two more days for sassing him. I feel more lonesome at the boy's departure. The silence grows more oppressive. The hours of darkness heavier. I mean, I'm an openly gay man myself, and even I was shocked by this. I wanted to understand it a little bit better in the context of the late 1890s. And also Goldman's initially being mystified by the concepts of earnings and lesbians. So I ran it by Professor Claire Hemmings. She teaches feminist theory at the London School of Economics, and she's the author of a book called Considering Emma Goldman, Feminist Political Ambivalence and the Imaginative Archive. Here's what she said. Yeah, it's super interesting, isn't it, how they thought about sexuality. There's no concept of LGBT rights at the time. The question of sexual identity in and of itself as even something one would claim is in emergence at that period, right? So you have the importance of sexuality as as part of human expression and as part of how one engages in the world and as part of how you see your relationships to others is, is, you know, in the period that they're living in, being worked out, it's in its inauguration. And so certainly they wouldn't have that language or, or sense available to them of this. It's not even that they didn't pay attention, it's that it's not available as, as something that you would single out in that way. That said, I mean, Goldman spent her life uh, defending, I mean, she was one of the people who defended Wilde during his trials. Uh, she defended Whitman. She um, had a correspondence with uh, Edward Carpenter and Havelock Ellis. She was super interested in questions of, um, as we know, of minority freedoms. Uh, And one of the ones that she thought about quite a lot in relationship to men was the relationship between homosexuality and creativity. She wrote um, quite a lot about that, much of it unpublished. So it's quite interesting because... We know she did um, give lectures on homosexuality as an anarchist concern uh, and that she would have been in favour of this as not being demonised. That's clear. But we don't have any of the lectures that she uh, gave, unfortunately, uh, and it's not quite clear what happened to them or why and, you know, so on. One can speculate. As far as I know, after Berkman got out of prison, he never had another homosexual relationship. Although the details aren't exactly clear, in addition to defending gay rights, Goldman did have a lesbian affair of her own, which we'll talk about in a later episode. In the meanwhile, though, she took the midwifing skill set she learned in Vienna and put them into practical use in the tenements of the Lower East Side. To understand what it must have been like to be a midwife, you have to consider the legal picture, especially the Comstock Law of 1873. It was named for Anthony Comstock, whose whole mission in life was to patrol other people's morals. He was all in on censorship, both as the founder of something called the New York Society for the Suppression of Vice, and then later on as U.S. Postal Inspector. Linda Gordon is a history professor at NYU. She's the author of Woman's Body, Woman's Right, The History of Birth Control Politics in America. And more recently, she wrote The Second Coming of the KKK, the Ku Klux Klan of the 1920s in the American political tradition. I asked her if birth control and contraception were political issues in 1896, when Emma Goldman first got back from Europe and started working as a midwife. Absolutely. The Comstock Law of 1873 not only banned the shipment of birth control devices across state lines, but it banned shipping across state lines, even pamphlets that argued for the importance of birth control. Now, of course, that doesn't mean it was well enforced. Uh, So, for example, the rate of abortion continued very, very high. And increasingly, abortion became what you might call the poor people's birth control, the birth control of people who didn't have access 
to a method that would allow you to prevent conception in the first place. The pregnant women that Goldman worked with were uniformly poor and generally desperate. Midwifery offered a very limited scope. In emergencies, one was compelled to call for the aid of a physician. Ten dollars was the highest fee. The majority of women could not pay even that. But while my work held no hope of worldly riches, it furnished an excellent field for experience. It put me into intimate contact with the very people my ideal strove to help and emancipate. It brought me face to face with the living conditions of the workers, about which, until then, I had talked and written mostly from theory. Their squalid surroundings, the dull and inert submission to their lot, made me realize the colossal work yet to be done to bring about the change our movement was struggling to achieve. Still more impressed was I by the fierce, blind struggle of the women of the poor against frequent pregnancies. Most of them lived in continual dread of conception. The great mass of the married women submitted helplessly, and when they found themselves pregnant, their alarm and worry would result in the determination to get rid of their expected offspring. It was incredible what fantastic methods despair could invent. Jumping off tables, rolling on the floor, massaging the stomach, drinking nauseating concoctions, and using blunt instruments. These and similar methods were tried, generally with great injury. It was harrowing, but it was understandable. Having a large brood of children, often many more than the weekly wage of the father, could provide for. Each additional child was a curse, a curse of God, as Orthodox Jewish women and Irish Catholics repeatedly told me. Goldman was horrified by the predicaments that these women found themselves in and the ways that they tried to get rid of their unwanted pregnancies. After such confinements, I would return home sick and distressed, hating the men responsible for the frightful condition of their wives and children, hating myself most of all because I did not know how to help them. I could, of course, induce an abortion. Professor Gordon told me that back then, like now, women who wanted an abortion were usually overwhelmed. One thing is the same today as it was in 1890, and that is that the primary group of women that want to have abortions are women who already have a number of children and who feel like they can't handle it. It wouldn't be good for the children they already have. They don't have the budget for it. It just doesn't make sense. A contributing factor to the problem back then was that birth control was just as illegal as abortion. The Comstock Law of 1873 made absolutely no distinction between what we would call contraception and abortion. And that was true uh, for a long time. And the reliance on abortion was something that raised tricky problems for people like Goldman or Sanger, which is whether you could overtly honor that kind of uh, tactic of having an abortion. Uh, many people drew back from that. Although, you know, if you reach back, even a conservative, what we might think of as a conservative feminist like Elizabeth Cady Stanton helped some people get abortions. People saw that as as a reasonable thing to do. What happened later is that you got this division between contraception and abortion. And basically, contraception was legalized through a process of separating it from abortion. But in fact, if you had talked about it in terms of the popular culture of what uh, were the remedies for some of the problems of poor people, abortion was a very, very logical and widespread choice. And even though Goldman totally understood the problems that these women faced and had no ethical objections to abortions, there were a couple of practical reasons why she wouldn't perform the procedures herself. 
I could not prevail on myself to perform the much-coveted operation. I lacked faith in my skill, and I remember my Vienna professor, who had often demonstrated to us the terrible results of abortion. He held that even when such practices prove successful, they undermine the health of the patient. I would not undertake the task. It was not any moral consideration for the sanctity of life. A life unwanted and forced into abject poverty did not seem sacred to me. But my interests embraced the entire social problem, not merely a single aspect of it. And I would not jeopardize my freedom for that one part of the human struggle. I refused to perform abortions, and I knew no methods to prevent conception. Professor Gordon thought that, given Goldman's unique position, that was probably the right decision. Of course, because Emma Goldman was a marked woman. I mean, she was extremely controversial and condemned widely by establishment sources. So, you know, had she been caught trying to help in an abortion, it would not only have been bad for her, it would have been bad for the whole cause because of her position. The prohibition against birth control presented a stark choice between Anthony Comstock's desire to go around controlling everyone's personal choices and the right to live your life the way you want to. It was a burden not only on the women and on their children, but on their husbands too. Yes, and you know, there's something else that she discovered and other people discovered who were visiting the homes of working class people, and that is that the ban on birth control was terrible for marriages because it put women in a position of being so nervous about getting pregnant that they didn't want to have sex with their husbands. And you get a lot of tension around that. And that was actually part of another aspect of what you might call her anarchism and her feminism, which is the notion that sexual pleasure is a human right that it is not something to be ashamed of, that women should have access to sexual pleasure as well as men. So that is just another aspect in which this whole drive to legalize birth control uh, was concerned. Professor Hemmings explained to me how Goldman recognized that both men and women were trapped by the inability to decide how many children they wanted to have. And this meant that they couldn't participate in the revolutionary struggle even if they wanted to. Until women have the ability not to reproduce when they decide that they have had enough or if they decide not to reproduce at all, then basically um, they will not be free to participate in revolutionary activity because they'll be having and raising children. And interestingly, and men will also be caught in a family structure that means that they also, uh, there's a greater risk for them in becoming revolutionaries too. So uh, Goldman's um, argument in a way was that if you had large families and you didn't have a choice about it, then in a sense you were caught in terms of accepting appalling terms by employers because you couldn't afford to not earn a wage at all because, of course, it would mean dire poverty and death and and so on of your family rather than just of you. And for Goldman, until you were able to liberate yourself from the kind of, in a way, the blackmail of employers, uh, then you would never be free to, you know, be a full participant in uh, revolutionary anarchism. So it's interesting because she saw birth control as an issue that would be one of liberation for both women and men. At about the same time, Goldman was beginning to feel a little disappointed in her old friend Fedya. You remember Fedya. He was the third part of the throuple with Goldman and Berkman, and the three of them lived together and ran the ice cream parlor in Massachusetts. Since then, he'd gotten pretty successful as an artist. He was actually so successful that he helped pay for her trip to Europe. He offered to pay for her ticket home, too, but she decided she'd rather use that money on books. She was beginning to worry that maybe all the money was going to his head and making him a little superficial, especially because he kept furnishing and refurnishing his artist studio over and over again without any real reason. They stayed close, even though she really didn't love his new friends, who were mostly journalists. She thought they were making him cynical, like they were, and turning him away from his previous revolutionary ideals. In 
Next week, Berkman gets Goldman to help him in planning a prison escape, and police in two states rush to capture Goldman after President McKinley is assassinated in Buffalo. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please be sure to subscribe and to tell your friends. Check out acrossfromjericho.com for all sorts of good stuff like pictures, transcripts, show notes, and links to all of our socials. Across from Jericho is a Split River Media production, researched and narrated by me, Jeff Grossman. This episode starred Sarah Natacheni as Emma Goldman and Roy North as Alexander Berkman. Audio mixing and sound design by Scott Rosenthal. Logo and graphics by Mark Richard Smith. The website was designed by Alec Farrell, and the theme music is Yo Cool by Alexander Nakarada. Special thanks to Brad Jarman, Teresa Buchheister, the Emma Goldman Papers Public History Project, Karen J. Greenberg, and Ethan Nickturn. Dedicated to the memory of my dad, Richard Grossman. Copyright 2023 by Split River Media, LLC.